Hello again. Today I want to talk about assumptions which are the greatest crime to humanity. The truth has no opinions or beliefs. Both opinion and belief are at their very core either truth or a presumption. An uncertainty and most likely a lie we have told ourselves somewhere along the line to make ourselves feel that we're correct. So how can you know if something is truth or just a presumption? The closest you can get to knowing truth is to witness it, to see it, hear it, taste it, smell it or feel it. But even what we witness can be an illusion, created by someone else's lie or a deliberate manipulation. Having said this, I quote Martin Rees, astronomer, royal, former master of Trinity College and ex-president of the Royal Society. Absence of evidence isn't absence of absence. If you can't see or feel or witness what you believe, it's safe to say that you're either assuming something is correct or you're t telling a lie. Second-hand knowledge comes with a lot of trust. We put a hell of a lot of trust in those who teach us those who have written historic events. Yet if those people were alive today, we wouldn't put our trust in them to take care of our bank accounts. So why do we put our trust in people we don't know when it comes to our knowledge? We can say they were there, but were they? Or were they getting their information second hand too? Did they have reason to boost the story to make it appear more interesting? or a, a friend more heroic, or demonise a person they despised. Do you see what I'm getting at? The human mind is filled with so many illusions appearing real. And the only people we can only safely trust is ourselves, and perhaps at a pinch, those who are consistently honest and reliable and truthful by nature. Once somebody has lied to us, they have ultimately lost something precious about themselves in you. And when I say that we can only trust ourselves, even this is an illusion because once you attach an assumption to a piece of evidence, you start to bend the truth to support it. Every time we make an assumption about what people say or do, we imprison them and us into a separate reality. When we believe in those assumptions and act accordingly, these separate realities become an existential torture chamber for them and ultimately for us. All the terror and pain that we experience is all a result of our assumptions. And so I maintain that assumptions are the greatest crime to humanity. So how do we escape from this illusion? that has built up possibly over many lifetimes. Well, think about it. There's no stress in the universe, only people thinking stressful thoughts. And stressful thoughts create stressful people who overreact. Overreaction leads to all kinds of drama and this drama in a world of ever-expanding technology has the potential to cause long-term damage and even permanent damage to humanity globally. For instance, Martin Rees also wrote in Our Cosmic Habitat, there may be a lot more life out there than we could ever detect. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Absence of direct evidence may not be proof of absence, but often Absence of evidence is evidence of absence. So in the case of Iraq, if weapons inspector looked for weapons of mass destruction in a building and finds nothing, is that absence of evidence or evidence of absence? I would argue that it is evidence of absence. 
Rumsfeld took a principle used in one context. Is there intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? And applied it to Iraq. Imagine someone tells you that there's an elephant in the room and you search the room. Opening drawers, checking closets, looking under the bed. No elephant. Absence of evidence or evidence of absence. Ultimately, as we now know, weapons of mass destruction were not found in Iraq and Rumsfeld's belief proved to be false. Many people assume that Rumsfeld was lying, but he knew that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But it's possible that he was able to convince himself that he was telling the truth, or even worse, that he lacked the ability to discriminate between truth and fantasy. That over the years he had developed a philosophy that seemingly paid lip service to imperialism. The doctrine that all knowledge is derived from sense of experience, devalued evidence and made a mockery of logic. Alas, if you believe that you are 100% right, then your beliefs are like a hard, impenetrable, protective shell. But at what cost to human, innocent life? Yet having said this, spiritual expansion must intercede physical expansion. Physical expansion being the building of external things, buildings, weapons, war planes, computer systems, machines that create physical transportation. The list of technological advancement is as long as your ability to imagine. And this increase in technological advancements without the additional increase in empathy and spiritual self-regulation is very dangerous. Imagine the difference it would make if those who ran countries used a little empathy. If those leaders thought about the cost to human life. Some leaders hold this belief that this teaching the hard way is a positive way forward for countries. Their view being the more nationalism they create, the more children will choose to join armies and become soldiers that will protect that country. To teach our children that way, the only way is to get along in life that they have to fight their way to the top, that being too soft and too empathetic is dangerous to our future globally. Yet, as with Iraq, if we send soldiers to do harm in their countries, that the people of those countries are then forced to have to teach their children to kill and hold guns to protect their own homes. We're causing our own future catastrophe. Because techno technology is advanced everywhere, we just can't keep bombing them to keep them disabled. I question why our governments today don't ever look to the future and recognise what kind of future world we're creating when we continue this way. This destruction is simply a short-term solution and short-term solution is all we truly gain from this kind of destruction. Rather than work with other countries respecting one another's embedded belief systems, because it isn't a belief system that is the problem, it's how we deal with the fear of that belief system. And that's a job for those who order bombs to be dropped, and the education of the children that we're creating to build tomorrow's world. Wherever our place is, our intention grows in power and influence through the direct impact of mental energy. There are many children who can't cope with bullying in school, not only by other children, but by overworked teachers who have targets to meet. So along with the stress of homework assignments and extracurricular activities, unfortunately some students bear an additional burden, bullying. Teachers require a whole classroom of children to learn at the same level. 
There needs to be programs that teach empathy, interpersonal skills and respect for those who don't fit into the mainstream. But the educational system itself does not agree with the approach to managing bullying. There are vocal groups of naysayers who believe that focusing on social emotional skills and training and urging students to be accepting of those who are different is leading to the weakening of individual countries. They argue that bullying is really a form of socialisation, asserting that kids who do not conform to society's expectations are bringing on their own troubles. Yet I would say quite the opposite. These children have something to teach us. Patience and tolerance. Love and understanding. It's the case often that both children and adults who conform become the targets of bullying, whether in the classroom or in the workplace. When a child does end up being bullied, this same group of people advise that the victims should just fight back. Many of these people are the parents of children who encourage their children that if you get to, to become top of the class, the only way is by undermining others. Communities demand relative conformity, and it's what makes them communal. Non-conformity, where these bullied children then rebel, is destructive in, uh, in these destructive ways, usually where they feel safest, at home for example. Naturally, this results in exclusion. And the parents pay for this in the family courts where they get involved, where a system is failing parents as they become the targets of blame and children are removed. Whilst these children who have potential to become brilliant scientists and other great things get lost in a system that allows the undermining of children in order to build false superior force. And this is unacceptable. This type of superior force shows a lack of appreciation for the complexities of the bully-victim dynamics. Of today's world where bullying often takes place in new arenas such as the internet, Sure, a victim fights back and flattens his bully and the bully tends to back off. But what if the bullies are hiding behind a computer screen? What if the target is physically incapable of taking down the bully? And what if the bully is being bullied themselves at home and is taking it out in school and other places because that's the only place that they can take back control of their own lives? It is this defying fact that keeps many evolving beings locked in various states of dis-ease. Imbalance and separation, as we wade through streams of discordant thought bent on the healing of an imperfect condition, we keep ourselves anchored in this very thing we are aiming to transmute. So isn't it time we teach our children, all of them, inner self-confidence? In keeping their focus sharp upon the patterns of the knowledge of their own individual self-perfection, to focus upon each and every individual's strength rather than their weaknesses. This perfected condition becomes our reality as we come into greater resonance with the natural laws of the universe. To teach that the only way to truly learn about something is to understand all perspectives of it and not just the ones that you favour or were taught is the only truth. To not worry about what others are doing, just focus upon doing the best you can do because in the end, that's all any of us can really have any control over. Every one of us, no matter our ability or disability, when the mental body is controlled, we all gain ability for pure and creative thought forms and resonate with the spirit of service. We don't need to create followers or leaders or teachers or spiritual authority figures. Everybody should be free and equal. Everyone can step up to their own divinity. 
Every human being is able to take a step, a, a deep personal responsibility for their lives, to realise their own divine creative nature, to realise the beauty or ugliness that they see in the world as a reflection of what they hold within. If our mental body remains dependent upon the old pattern of solely making decisions based on linear logic, we bypass the ability to intuitively recognise natural universal laws, like the law of secret synchronicity, at work in our daily lives. To overcome this is simply allowing love to come in and transmute the thoughts that entrap and keep us locked in a vice of old programming. The mastery of the mental body is the great transfiguration when we transition from an emotional based focus to an intelligent thinking focus.